Shadow of the Tomb Raider is like your favourite pair of lucky socks. Every time you wear them, the best things happen to you. You have a great day, you enjoy yourself, luck is in your favour, you kick everyone's ass. but at the same time, you can't help but notice that the only thing that keeps them lucky is the fact that you don't wash them, and no matter how great everything is when you wear them, there's this constant musky, dingy and horrific smell that lingers around your nostrils the entire time. That's Shadow of the Tomb Raider to me. I absolutely loved my time in this game, yet I can't deny that it is one of the most extreme cases of a safe and bland sequel I've ever played. But I do say that with the utmost praise, if that makes any sense whatsoever. Aside from a few things, there is nothing massively new to this game that you haven't seen before if you've played the original reboot or Rise of the Tomb Raider, and sadly, that makes the whole game feel like it's just there. You run and jump around, solve physics-based puzzles often with strict time limits, hunt down packs of animals for rare skins and to stay alive because everything here is an aggressive old bastard, explore totally optional crypts and tombs for special treasures to unlock more abilities, upgrade your gear and use skill points to level up at campfires, and get into the occasional gunfight for the sake of survival or because Lara Croft is now a bloodthirsty monster, I really can't decide at this point. It's exactly what you'd expect. Oh, but one thing that's very cool though, once I realised at the first campfire that there were added costumes to make you look like Lara Croft from the Angel of Darkness and Lara from PS1 Tomb Raider 2, that made the entire thing at least 19 times more enjoyable for me. I mean, how can you not love this? Yeah, it does completely ruin the more intense moments and emotional scenes meant absolutely nothing, but with this game specifically, it didn't matter to me because not only were all the emotional moments diving into themes and concepts I already knew about Lara from the last two games, but also because this story was total garbage. Okay, I don't want to go into all that stuff just yet and begin too negatively. This is a good game after all and I want to start positively, but before I get ahead of myself, it's time for me to give the warning. Spoilers are right, okay, nice. Well, I mean, to begin with possibly the most impressive part of the whole thing, Shadow of the Tomb Raider looks utterly spectacular. I had to lift my jaw off of the floor multiple times from some of the sweeping camera shots of some of the grander tombs I was able to discover, and the action set pieces with how they managed to run so smoothly with only a handful of hiccups when there were a load of people on the same screen. The water as well is phenomenal. Look at this water! And how about the way that light is used? It's some of the most impressive I've ever seen. The way that the light reacts to different individual particles from fog to dust is something to behold, if your PC can handle the option, that is. And hey, another cool thing about the game happens on screen before you even start the first cutscene. You have individual difficulty options for the combat, exploration and puzzles. The combat difficulty affecting enemy AI and damage dealt and received, the puzzle difficulty affecting how fast physical objects move and hints, and the exploration difficulty affecting how many things you are able to highlight with your survival instincts during those moments when you're left alone in more open areas. Personally, I just went with hard mode for everything, and I'm really glad I did, not just for a more satisfying challenge, but because having everything highlighted for you with survival instincts got extremely annoying for me very quickly with the booming sound effect and frequency of which the screen goes black and white to try and help you out when you use it. In that sense, the easier the difficulty and the more you rely on the game to hold your hand, the more irritating it could be for me. It's a compromising system, and it encouraged me to play the game in not only the most enjoyable, but also close to the original Tomb Raider way as possible. Being left loose in the wild with things trying to kill you and ancient artifacts to uncover in slightly linear yet explorable stages. I relied way too heavily on survival instincts in Rise of the Tomb Raider which then led me to not absorb and remember a lot of the level layouts but here I was able to bond with these areas a lot more and form a better connection with the things around me. That is a very satisfying feeling and useful for the stealth segments when I was able to vividly remember all the best hiding places for plans of attack and by the way with this game being mostly set in deep jungles I was getting major MGS3 vibes from this whole thing, and the way that you can find optional puddles of mud to then access more hiding places, or hide in trees and string up enemies Spider-Man PS4 style made this the best stealth system in Tomb Raider for me. This leads me on to talking about the actual tomb exploring and platform puzzle solving, which in my opinion are the absolute best in the trilogy we have at this time. Many of them completely stumped me for a good few minutes with the lack of survival instincts to help me out, and they are some of the most varied and memorable in the entire reboot trilogy. Not only testing out your platforming reactions, but also perception, timing, placing things in order, positioning. I loved them all, and combining this with just the right balance of combat and stealth gameplay in the overall story made this my favourite Tomb Raider to play overall. Yeah, believe it or not, there isn't actually that much gunfighting and sneaking around, especially compared to the first game. This is mostly a classic Tomb Raider with more modern elements, especially with me choosing to not have any hints, no highlights, no enemy locations, or any idea which enemies would see me if I went in for a stealth kill. It was just me and the game with the occasional sunlight glint to let me know about hidden treasures and vibrations on the controller to let me know when to dig, and I massively preferred it like that. You explore more to find more and learn more, which in turn gives you the XP you need, tomb treasures that you don't just collect but could also trade in this time, more crafting materials for additional swappable costumes that all provide different stat boosts, and even new usable items like temporary perception enhancers. And even better, I never chose to use these enhancers, so I traded them into the merchants as well for more money to get the things I actually wanted to make use out of. Also yeah, there's a merchant system this time, unlike Rise of the Tomb Raider which saw you picking up specific hidden currency to trade in for a limited number of items, here you can buy or sell practically everything with special 
specialised merchants in the villages. It allows you to completely tackle the game in your own way by letting you sell arrows if you don't use the bow that much, and then you can use that money to buy crafting materials to make better clothing or anything. It's all up to you. And it also gives more use to the treasures you uncover in tombs and not just for collecting sake like in the previous games. But I also do believe that despite there being carrying capacity upgrades you can purchase later on in the game, the fact that there's even a limit in the first place I found to be total bullshit considering how the game is structured. If you find a campfire but don't have quite enough of one material for creating what you want, it'll be a while before you find another campfire again, so you either have to go to a random place and hope there's a material you can find to complete the set, or find the correct merchant to buy the correct thing, not only wasting time but also preventing you from collecting the potential dozens of extra other materials you could save for later when you need them. I mean, especially in tombs, you find a tomb, you solve the tomb, you leave the tomb, you've got no reason to go back, so why not let me completely strip it dry and properly reward my exploration without going to a merchant nearby to clear my inventory just because I can't use what I have backed up in my inventory because I can't craft what I want to craft just yet because of maybe one material that I haven't got yet. There's so much stuff I left behind in tombs never to be seen again and so many things I never managed to craft because of that. I'm not saying this system can't work in a game, but with how this game in particular is structured and paced, it makes no sense. But hey, at least the pace of the game is never interrupted by a menu opening up for a voice to narrate what you've just picked up. You can pick it up and move on, or listen in if you're into the historical inspirations for the locations. For another new thing I really liked, Lara can now use her grapple to repel and swing from ledges and climbing walls. Now, is this as versatile, quick, frantic, and naturally woven into the game as Uncharted 4's grapple? Not at all. Combat options for this aren't even a thing, but that doesn't take away from how much of a nice addition it is to Lara's moveset that can even increase how you think about puzzles and treasure reaching. What is better than Uncharted however are the climbing segments. Not only are they not blindingly obvious and highlighted on where you can go like a train track, but often have actual danger to avoid, and require more attention from you as a player in case you need to save yourself with the grapple. My favourite parts of the game by far though were the villagers, since they aren't just simple meet and greet places with side quests to be given to you. They can be totally huge and with their own hidden tombs and pretty tricky platforming puzzles to find. I spent hours in this village in particular exploring every corner, climbing every cliff face, diving in every body of water I could and swinging off every tree looking for tombs to upgrade Lara's moveset, and I think even after spending hours and hours in there, I only got about 60-70% to 70 of the entire village covered and I enjoyed every moment of it. Oh, I forgot to mention that as well, swimming is also a thing now, to feel even more like classic Tomb Raider. Which isn't mind-blowing or anything, but adds another dimension to exploration, gives you another thing to panic about when you're losing air, and just feels right at home in this game with all the caverns to uncover. The game even has a solid Croft Manor segment where Lara has a dream of her as a kid solving one of the many secrets of her old family estate. Nowhere near as free roaming or fun as the original games, on PS1 for sure, but still a brilliant surprise nonetheless. Exploring the mansion with some of the best visuals in the game as a kid, Lara imagining herself as a world famous explorer going around her own personal playground was adorable. And even better, I was shocked to discover not only additional puzzles and challenges, but they also added to your total XP count. That's a brilliant touch and made exploring the dream sequence itself more fun instead of just going through it for the sake of the story. Oh wait, I've mentioned it haven't I? Okay, let's loop back around to that shall we? The story of Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I didn't like it whatsoever and it really dampened the whole experience when it was already dampened by how similar it felt to the other games. If you ask me, this is the worst story of the reboot Tomb Raider trilogy, which is a shame because even though it resorts once again to the whole Trinity are a bad secret organisation shit and you must continue your father's work nonsense all over again without adding anything remotely new, there's a few cool ideas here. We have an end of the world plot to deal with since Lara stole an artefact from a tomb that caused it, but she had to take the thing to stop the evil Trinity from taking it first, not only leaving Lara to deal with the consequences of her determination and eagerness, but also providing a lose-lose scenario that no one could have helped unless Lara was there to start off the events first. I also really like Lara and her best buddy Jonah as characters. They're great and their chemistry is really good in this game, and they spend a lot of the time together as well. Jonah especially is one of the most huggable people I've ever seen in a video game. However, this starts to crumble apart beginning with some of the dialogue. In some of the more emotionally driven moments, they start talking about their pasts to each other, which I didn't buy personally, since they've already been friends for years at this point and been through near-death situations many times, meaning the writers probably just thought about adding backstory these best friends could both chat about that relate exactly to the themes of the overarching story of this particular game. And I mean, they are best friends after all. They definitely would have talked about most of this stuff that they discuss in the game years ago, so none of it comes across as genuine or natural to me. This is just one small thing though that dominoes into everything else. Every other friendly character, for example, adds basically nothing to anything, and I remember absolutely nothing about them despite how much they appear in cutscenes. And there's this twist in the story, where the bad guy that you met face to face with at the very start of the game trying to steal this world ending artifact from you is in fact the head of a jungle tribe cult in order to find the next part of the puzzle. 
But the problem is, not only is this the second time you see him in the entire game, but this twist appeared for me eight hours into the game. Eight hours. This isn't a twist. This is a reminder that he's a character that you met once before at the start of the game eight hours ago. And this whole village bit may be my favorite gameplay part, but for the story, it's easily the slowest at this point. Yeah, the cult versus rebels plot can be brutal, but aside from the imagery, it doesn't develop anything else within the village's story or within the overarching story. And get this, out of absolutely nowhere in the last quarter of the game or so, you get a totally new random bad guy called Commander Rourke, who isn't only a random boring military commander, but starts to do things like hack into your radio comms. So when Jonah starts calling you, you tell him to stop calling because you know that they're listening in. Fair enough, makes sense, right? But then you immediately try calling Jonah back a few minutes later after a combat sequence, at which point Rourke then tells you Jonah is dead, which is so obviously bullshit it isn't even funny, but Lara, this intelligent, fearless, acrobatic, ancient history genius, believes everything this random guy is telling her, who she doesn't know and shouldn't trust, leading the military to come after Lara with a helicopter, which she then destroys by using oil barrels that are right next to the helicopter, and despite the pilot saying out loud that the barrels are going to make them blow up and they should probably move, from the barrels, they don't, and get blown up an additional two times and then crash. I mean, this whole Kill Bill badass revenge mode part of the game is very enjoyable and it's interesting to see Lara in this awful state, don't get me wrong, but the story backing it up is more shallow and broken than a puddle in a saucepan with a hole in it. The ending too? What the hell was that about? You stop the evil bad guy cult leader from trying to reshape the world, he then tells you to do the right thing after trying to kill you multiple times and we're supposed to feel sympathetic for him, and then logically this means that we have to then sacrifice ourselves to save everything since it's all up to the guardians of these world changing relics to decide when shit needs to actually change and then we die. But we don't actually die and come back at the... And yeah, the whole world ending stuff is pretty serious and all, but when you're shown straight away a tsunami at the start of the game to punish Lara for her immediate actions, only for nothing else to happen gameplay wise until a volcanic eruption near the end of the game, which is a good 20 or so hours in, you don't feel the urgency or importance of the world ending, killing whatever sense of danger or high stakes the story had going for it. And yeah, there are some scary moments of the game that the characters have to go through, but the way Lara reacts to the brutality of some of these things just doesn't feel right at this point anymore. I know we're three games in and she's probably used to it a little bit, but some of this stuff just felt like another day in the office, you know, the same way Nathan Drake would react, and when you're going for the tone that Uncharted goes for, the nonchalant angle kind of works, but with the utterly hellish death scenes and serious emotional nonsense here, the context of what actually happens feels pretty damn bland. Tomb Raider is slowly starting to lose its identity because of that, along with all the gameplay being mostly the same kind of thing. Not only that, but if you're going to include an option that allows locals to actually talk in their language instead of English, that's great, that's clever, that's immersive, but why not have Lara then respond back in the same language as them, because otherwise it makes no damn sense. We know she can understand them, she studies these languages, so when she responds in English for the benefit of us, does this mean that everyone else around you can understand English if she's able to reply to them in English and then they keep the conversation going? Sorry, that's really petty, I know that's not a huge deal to a lot of people, it annoyed me though. And the most annoying thing about the whole game though, on a serious note, is that it is still great. It's still slick, challenging, and the exploration is the most satisfying of the series, but it just doesn't do enough to stand out from the last games in my opinion. And it may have moments of brilliance, but overall it's a little bit too been there, done that. If you haven't played a newer Tomb Raider before, honestly, I think you can get away with starting here. It's the best one to play and shows off everything Tomb Raider should be in my opinion, for a modern day at least. In many places I could swear I was playing Tomb Raider Anniversary again, and you won't miss out on any story shit either because it really doesn't matter here. The weapons, hunting, tomb raiding, stealth, it's all top notch here, but it's only that level of incredible if this is the only reboot Tomb Raider you have played. Otherwise, it's more of the same in many areas, just with a terrible story to keep things moving. And hey, since it is nearly Halloween, there's even creepy things to find. Weird statues in weird formations in the water, and even the artifact Guardian Cannibal guys. These were really scary, actually, jumping out at you all over the place, their lairs soaked with blood and organs, and their deep throaty breathing letting you know they were surrounding you. Ugh, yeah. If you're looking for something brand new that's kind of related to Halloween but isn't that scary, then yeah, give this one a go. If it's your birthday today while watching this video, happy friggin' birthday to you, and please remember to stay beautiful. Hey, 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 hey. Howdy everybody, thank you so much for staying until the very end of this video review of Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Really enjoyed it, really loved it, got about 25 hours or so of gameplay out of it, which I enjoyed every single minute of it, but yeah, overall, it's the same kind of thing, and I really didn't like the story, so what did you guys- oh, I hit that, no, don't hit that. 
What is that? It's a key ring. Don't hit the key ring on the side of the desk. A special thank you to all the names going past on the screen right now um, from my Patreon page. You're so kind. You helped make this video possible. Thank you. And just before I go, I'm going to thank my top tier Patreon supporters, which you can find out more info about in the description below. Omar Matu, William Sanborn, Mitchell Reed, DC Dungeon Master, Braden Kenny, Jake Delahaye 2008. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm sorry if I got it wrong. AD Thornton Smith, Exopaz, Thomas Olson, QB, Nathan Young, I Have a Portal Gun, Cyberpunk Symphony, Mills Kahai, Oblivion Rising, Matthew Hubble, Binary Code, Daniel Leon, Kirsten B, and Brandon Brandon. Great name there. Thank you so much, every single one of you.